Thank you all for coming. Uh, bringing it local. Uh, chatting with Jim uh, earlier today, uh, he, as, a, as a child, he actually spent a, a number of years here growing up in Houston. Went to Frostwood right. Elementary, if any of you went there and uh, are familiar with it. So, so welcome back to Houston, Jim. I was an Oilers fan, you know, I, yeah. that's, a, that's a while ago. <laughs> yeah, me, t me too. <laughs> yeah, uh, Earl Campbell all the way. Um, uh, for a lot of people who've known your you know, excellent reporting from all over the world, often some of the, the worst, the most difficult hot spots, whether it be Iraq or Afghanistan or contentious places like China uh, and dealing with, say, Russia and being on the ground in Ukraine, um, th they know that you are uh, absolutely not one to sensationalize things. You are not trying to incite fear or anything like that. You're, you're known for being a thorough, you know, direct uh, and straightforward journalist with a very good reputation. But in case people are wondering and a bit you know, intimidated almost by it, can you explain why you felt the need to open this book with describing in, in pretty good detail why in 2022 yeah. the world maybe got closer to a nuclear conflict than or at least a brink of it since maybe the early 80s before Gorbachev mm. and possibly maybe even similarly so uh, not quite, but the level of 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Can you talk about why, why you feel that is there, and, and not to scare people, but what is the message you want this audience, an American audience, and a broader audience to take away from the book? Yeah, I was thinking when I, when I was looking for the ballroom and I saw the other one that's Houston shock. I said, that, that, that could have been my, my talk as well. Not intentional. No, it's not, it's not meant, the, the book, neither the book nor the story is meant to instill fear but my intention is to draw attention to what I think is, a, one, a genuine change in, in the state of our world, and, and two, a genuine threat. And that it, the idea being that awareness makes us safer, right? That we, we have to be aware of these trend lines and respond to them, and, and we can't imagine that these events happening far away don't affect us and don't threaten us or threaten things that we, that, uh, that we hold dear. And, um, let me, let me start with, with what happened in, in late 2022, late summer 2022, early fall. Th this was uh, the first few months of, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And at the time, Russia was losing ground. Uh, they were getting pushed back in Kherson, which had been really their biggest prize since the invasion, the, 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 the biggest city that they had captured. There were thousands of Russian troops that were at risk of being surrounded there as Ukrainian forces were advancing. And Russian military doctrine has nuclear weapons much lower in the escalation ladder than we do. In fact, they have a whole category of weapons that we don't have, tactical nuclear weapons or battlefield nukes, which are smaller, still devastating. They're, they're, they're not the kind that could destroy a city, uh, but they're damn powerful, right? And, and, uh, and they have in their doctrine to use such weapons in response to a conventional threat. In other words, it doesn't have to be because you fired an ICBM at my city. And the read from the Pentagon and, and from US intelligence agencies was that Russia was losing so much so quickly that Russian leadership might calculate that this is a severe conventional threat to our whole military op operation in Ukraine and that we may have to drop a nuke to respond. Now, th there were other pieces to that picture that created this assessment, one of which was that Russian officials started speaking publicly about Ukraine carrying out a radi radi radiological attack, not a nuclear attack, a dirty bomb. Uh, you had the Russian uh, foreign minister, the Russian defense minister, uh, shouting as loudly as they could that, oh, Ukraine is planning this and we have to respond. That was another piece because Russia has a pattern of creating false flag attacks. They did this in the early stages of the war where they lit off some bombs in eastern Ukraine, which they blamed on Ukrainian terrorists. Of course, these were Russian operations. But the idea was that this was meant to be a justification. Oh, we have to come in to placate the situation because Ukraine is, a, you know, is, is out of control. So they have a history of that. And then the final piece is that US intelligence intercepted conversations of Russian commanders discussing using a tactical nuclear weapon. So that, that whole picture led them to, I think, a not unreasonable assessment that this was a real possibility. And that then launched a full court press from the US to prevent this from happening. And, and all the senior US officials, uh, CIA director, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Secretary of State, 
They called their counterparts or met their counterparts. Bill Burns, the CIA director, flew to Turkey to meet his counterpart, meet him face to face and say, what the heck are you guys planning here? And if you were to use a nuke, there would be a forceful response. In addition to that, the US enlisted two unconventional allies in this, both China and India, calculating that neither China or India wanted nuclear war in Europe in, in the year 2022. And they didn't. And speaking to Blinken, which among others I interviewed for the book, he said that Chinese and Indian pressure helped avert what, what would have been quite a moment, right? Now, that, that threat has not disappeared. Uh, the other piece, actually, that was part of the assessment is around the time you had Russian officials talking a lot about, well, if need be, we might use nuclear weapons, which Putin just did two weeks ago, uh, or actually a week ago when he got reelected. So that's a frequent thing. And when I asked officials recently, has that fear totally abated? They say it has not risen to the level it was then, but it's, it, it hasn't gone away. They still look at that as a possible a possibility, which is... Yet one more measure of how this, this standoff can expand quickly beyond the, the, the comfort level that we have right now. And, and just to, to finish on that point, and then we'll, we'll move to uh, Ukraine itself and, and U.S. Western relations with, with Russia and China. But one of the alarming things was from Putin, even if there's not a direct threat to what the rest of the world thinks of as Russian territory, yeah. They have artificially incorporated mm -hmm. Crimea, Zaporizhia, uh, uh, Luhansk, and Donetsk. Those, you know, 20% of Ukraine they claim as Russian territory. And is there still the concern that even if they were to be yes. losing Ukrainian territory, that they might do this? Yes, because they falsely claim that that Ukrainian territory is now Russian territory and, and that they would consider that. I mean, the other piece is that another trigger for a Russian nuclear strike is a threat to the Russian state. The thing is, Putin sees the state as himself, and the war is so intertwined with, with his power that the, the, the fear is that he would calculate, if I'm losing the war, that's a threat to me, and therefore that's a threat to the Russian state. Um, and just where we are in the war now, I think most people, like yourself and, and plenty of the, the highest ranking military experts from the US and elsewhere and NATO, say this is, this is a long-term issue. This is not going away unless something dramatic happens anytime soon. Um, but the thing that maybe could change it is the degree, uh, particularly of American support. Yeah. Could you give your assessment of where the war is now? And we see it in Congress now, still trying to get some hope for yeah. passing support for the Ukraine, especially military support. Uh, and what are the realities if America cut off that support? And, and in reality, as, as, as great it is to have the rest of our NATO allies, most people think they alone could not yeah. be enough for the Ukrainians, right? So the Ukrainians are in trouble you know, in, because, uh, in part, they're running out of ammunition. And, and they're, getting, they're getting outshot 5 to 1, sometimes 10 to 10 to 1, in what has become a real artillery battle in the East. It's a very World War II type uh, battle in many respects. How many can you fire? How quickly? Ukraine can't because they're running out. And I've spoken to Ukrainian commanders on the front lines who I keep in touch with, and they say that we're, we're losing, soldiers are dying as a result of that because they're getting outfired and outgunned. They're, they've also gotten short on air defense missiles, which makes it harder to shoot, shoot them down when they come in, and, and Russia knows that. There was an attack in the last 24 hours where Russia just fired, you know, attempting to overwhelm the systems, they fired a whole bunch of cruise missiles at the same time, knowing that they're running out of, of air defense missiles. So they're, they're you know, in real danger. And yes, you, you, European partners have been giving more, but the US has the largest military in the world. It, ha it just has more stuff, right, and more capabilities. And without US support, they're in danger of losing. Now, it's not happening today. I mean, the, the, the front lines in the east are pretty much frozen. Russia's been sort of trying to poke holes through there. Um, but um, you know, the, the real danger is that even if that line doesn't move, Russia's in the process of just burning down the country. They're just burning it down. You know, the, the territory that they overtake, you've seen the pictures. I mean, these were once gloriously beautiful cities, uh, and, and they're no longer. And that includes places that they occupy. Mm -hmm. and, and from the air, they're just dropping bombs everywhere and, and targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure, et cetera. So it's a, it's a consequential time. And I'll tell you, just as a, as a reporter who was there in February 2022 as, this, as the invasion started, 
When I came back from that trip, I spent like four or five weeks at the start of the war. It was one of those moments where left and right, Republican and Democrat, were, were coming up to me in Washington and saying, boy, CNN is doing great work there. It's so good to see you. And you, you heard the public comments. It was a bipartisan uh, issue to support Ukraine. And public support for Ukraine was pretty, I don't know, not quite universal, but it was pretty strong. Mm -hmm. The change in two years is, is just remarkable to me. It's become a, it's not quite split down the middle because most Republicans support sending aid, but from a, the, the leadership does not, or, and, or it certainly doesn't see it as, pop, as a priority, and it, it is not a priority to the, you know, the putative head of the Republican Party. So it's, that's where it stands. And I just asked, I had a lawmaker on our show today, I said, so what, you know, because every other day I will hear, well, we got a plan to get this aid through, and the speaker said he's open to it, and if, we, if that doesn't work, then we'll do a discharge position, we'll go around the speaker. I've been hearing that for weeks, and it's just not clear if and when it's going to happen. And that would, that, that would have consequences for them. And you know, as you, you detail in the book, um, obviously Putin hoped he'd be taking Kiev mm -hmm. in the first three or four days. Yeah. He would take over the whole country in two or three weeks. That didn't happen. Um, but their concern is that he'll accept option two, which is a prolonged kind of frozen conflict. Yeah a war of attrition that the Russians historically, you mm -hmm. think of Stalin at, at World War II or even World War I before they pulled out, um, that Stalin, you know, uh, Stalin, <laughs> yeah, mistake, but Putin, he's just, he's uh, as, just as, as an autocrat, as, a, yeah, as an autocrat is very willing to sacrifice a few hundred thousand of his yeah. own people. He won't get too much blowback. Obviously, Zelensky, they have one third or some less of the population of the Russians. Yeah. Um, how do you address that concern that, that Putin's saying, I'm in it for the long haul, yeah. and I'm willing to wait until there's a change in political leadership in Europe, and maybe in particular political leadership in the United States? 100%. I, and so Russia doesn't care, right? It doesn't care if its soldiers die in general. Although, with the caveat in that this war deliberately is, is largely uh, giving exceptions to the, the, the sons of the rich and and powerful, right? It, you, it, they're, they're drawing on uh, kids from the hinterlands and not from Moscow, that, that kind of stuff. There's an there's a expression in, Mus in Russian, we, we call it cannon fodder, they call it cannon meat, right? Which is, which is like, just evokes the worst images, but that is, it sort of captures the way they're willing to just send these guys in waves there. Um, and there's fear now with his re-election, in quotes, that uh, he will do another partial mobilization, in other words, like a mini draft to get more folks to go. He does have that advantage. You know, this is the advantage of autocrats. They don't have to answer to the, the public. And when the public grows tired of the war, you know, they could just say, screw you guys, right? You know, excuse my language, but they can. In addition to the fact that they control the information space so they could just lie to them about the progress of the war. There's a lot of great uh, Russian reporting on how Russia has hidden the number of deaths, casualties from the war. And there are a couple great independent I quote them in the book, uh, Russian, formerly Russian-based magazines, now based out of the country because they've all been exiled, that did a great job. They, um, they uh, looked at inheritance data as a measure of the number of people in an age category that had died, and they were able to give a very accurate number of how many dead Russian soldiers there were, which was similar to the US intelligence assessment. Anyway, many tens of thousands more than Russians will admit to. So, but in a closed society, you can hide that stuff better. So he, he doesn't care. The one, the one uh, another caveat to this, though, is that I think we, sh we should be careful not to sort of ride the pendulum on who's on top, right? Because to your point, in the early days of the war, the US assessment was, the US assessment was right that ru the Russians were coming. And I talk a lot in the book about how nobody believed that right up to the moment, the troops, including my colleagues, till the troops came across the border. They were right. Um, they were wrong about how the Ukrainians would fight back. You know, the, the read was in 72 hours, Kyiv would fall, and lo and behold, no, they didn't, and they fought back, and, and they got better, and then they started gaining territory back. Um, so if we were talking a year ago, and this is about the time of the Munich Security Conference where you have this sort of confab of people in the national security space, the thinking at last year's Munich Security Conference was, Ukraine's gonna win this thing. 
And boy, Russia's in trouble, and we actually got to find a way that Russia doesn't lose too badly, because that would be destabilizing. The feeling at this year's Munich Security Conference was, oh no, Ukraine's losing, and Putin's on top. Now, the truth is probably somewhere in between. It is true that Ukraine is getting pushed back, and that they're facing severe challenges, um, in, 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 you know, in large part with the lack of US support. Um, but Russia also faces its own challenges, too. So it's, um, you know, I'm always conscious of not jumping too far to the, you know, all is lost category. The challenges are real, but it's not, you know, it's not lost yet. Um, and what, one of the parts I really appreciate about this book is a lot of people cover China, they cover Russia, they get the highest level military, political, and intelligence leaders. The U.S.'s perspective, you know, the, the, the you know, typical experts on Russia and China, but your book, we'll get to Taiwan, has a huge array of, of senior Taiwanese leadership, their perspective, and similarly so in Europe. You, you, you uh, interviewed the head of MI6 in the UK, uh, everything from a, a German uh, captain of, of one of the uh, you know, vessel in the German Navy, and to me, probably one of the more interesting ones was Prime Minister Kallas of mm. Estonia. And can you talk about how this has maybe woken up Europe, and she talks about it a lot, yeah. But there's also, understandably, but also very concerningly, a quite a different perspective between, sure. say, the Baltics and the Polish, uh, a place like Estonia that has a t almost 25% ethnic Russian population, which is how Putin justifies taking parts of Georgia in 2008, how he justifies 2014 um, fomenting a civil war in the Donbass and Crimea. Can you talk about what has changed in Europe mm -hmm. and maybe what is still concerning between how those yeah touching Russia have a much different perspective than those in the West or Central Europe. So um, I love the Estonians, by the way. I think this is a tiny country, a little over a million people, right on Russia's border there, could be so easily overwhelmed. And, and, and Russia has tried to crush them before. In 2007, they carried out what is still to date the largest nation-on-nation -nation cyber attack that's ever happened. They, they virtually shut the country down. Um, so, so Russia has no good intentions with Estonia, but they stand up, they have a highly technological uh, system, highly educated, they do everything online, and they, and they give far more than 3% of their budget to, to, to defense, and they send you know, more to Ukraine by percentage than we're sending. You know, so this is a, they're really leading the way, and she's you know, as, as tough as nails, um, but also very clear about the Russian threat. And she, which you, you do see, if you go to Eastern Europe, their view of Russia is uh, much more, and understandably so, much more alarmed by Russia for two reasons. One, they're, they're closer to it, right? I mean, they, they will be the first ones to, to, be, to be attacked next. And, and Kai Kalas will say this. She'll say, if Ukraine loses, we're next. They will come for us. Um, also, remember, it's only yesterday that they were part of the Soviet empire. The, the Balkans got their independence in 1991. That's like a minute ago. And, and folks like Kalas, they lived under it. They grew up under Soviet rule. They have no interest in going back. Um, you know, countries like Poland, they, they were part of the Warsaw Pact just yesterday, you know, in historical terms. So they're not making it up. They're not imagining what it's like to live under this kind of system. They know from firsthand experience and have no desire to go back to it. And you will see some kind of intra-European sniping between some folks in the East. And Kai Kalas will say it. She's like, my, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but she said, my Western, uh, to, to my Western NATO allies, the Russian threat is, is a hypothetical conversation. To us, it is existential. And that's not, it's not like a line you could draw down Europe that way because the UK, for instance, which is furthest away in NATO terms, you know, except for us, but has been very forward leaning. But some of the other countries are a little wobbly, right, when it comes to the Russia threat. In the East, they're not. And um, I suggest listen to the folks who know the threat best. And she, she, she quotes frequently um, uh, Churchill on Hitler. The, the famous quote uh, about the crocodile, that an appeaser is someone who feeds the crocodile expecting that he'll be its last meal. And she says that about Putin. You, you think you could just give him a slice of Ukraine and everything will be fine? No. You, that, that's, that's just the first of several meals along the way. And that, that conforms to recent history, too, if you think. I mean, Russia sliced off a piece of Georgia in 2008. The world was like, ah, we could live with that. 
two slices of Ukraine in 2014, uh, we could live with that. Attack Estonia, NATO ally, 2007, uh, maybe it's okay. He's just like sort of rattling the saber. No, each step, he, he, looks, for, he looks for more. Um, and I, I don't want to turn to Taiwan afterwards, but uh, in terms of lessons learned, but the, the big, huge picture has always been China. <clears throat> you know, what lessons are they taking from this? Thankfully, somewhat with uh, U.S. kind of assistance in making things public, they have not provided large-scale uh, military support mm -hmm. to the Russians, um, but maybe that could change. Um, how do you think this has changed President Xi's calculus, maybe in terms of accelerators slowing down any potential timeline for Taiwan? Uh, and, and in terms of the Chinese military, the PLA, in terms of how a war is being fought, tactics, yeah. it's very different, it's an island, uh, but maybe also in terms of how the world has reacted. So when I went to, I, I haven't talked to a single person for this book in Europe, the States, or Asia when I went to Taiwan, who does not believe that she is watching Ukraine very closely for lessons, both lessons on the battlefield, what weapon systems work, which don't, how to respond to them, but also how the world reacts, and specific, primarily how the U.S. reacts. What are the economic consequences of an invasion? How long do they hold out? You know, when do they get bored? When do they kind of run out of interest? That kind of thing. Um, everybody believes he's watching it closely. And, and the, the, in the early stages of the war, the kind of general thinking was, boy, Ukraine's going badly for Russia. That's got to give she pause. But as things have continued, there's concern that she might say, well, if Putin can wait out, Europe and, and the U.S., maybe I can wait them out, and, and it, would be worth, it would be worth my time and worth mm -hmm. the cost, because both Putin and Xi are very similar. I talk about this in the book in terms of their worldview in a number of ways, uh, which is kind of remarkable, because you have two guys, you know, different languages, cultures, religions, histories, backgrounds, etc. cetera, um, but both of them look at themselves as historic figures that are righting historical wrongs. For Putin, the greatest tragedy of the last century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he wants to rebuild it effectively. Um, for Xi Jinping, you know, like dart back a hundred years, the greatest tragedy is the Opium Wars. You know, we're talking mid 19th century Western subjugation of China, and his historic role is to put China back on it, not not like get up there for the first time, but put it back to where it belongs on kind of the top of the international order. And they both look at themselves as and they both given themselves leader for life status, busting their constitutions, ending term limits, whatever. They both consolidated power, exiled any kind of like Politburo type system. So they have a lot of commonalities in that sense too. So that concerns the folks who watch this very closely because they think that the thinking and the kind of calculus for a Xi would be similar to, to a Putin when it comes to Ukraine. Um, to your point, they are fundamentally different wars because it's just easier to roll tanks across the border than to do a massive seaborne landing D-Day style. It's harder to do that. Um, but there are other options for China, and I talk about it in the book. There's, there's thinking more now that China might try a boa constrictor mm -hmm. uh, which would, to, to encircle and suffocate. Taiwan, for instance, gets 95% of its fuel from outside of the country, so it wouldn't take long to Imagine Houston without, you know, without gas, right? Yeah. You know, it wouldn't take long to, to make them suffer. So that, so you have some differences, but you you definitely have some similarities, and they're they're watching. Um, and maybe just before you know, following up with Taiwan, um, you quote uh, General Milley, the the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff under for tr both Trump and uh, for Biden. For you know, for here it's the, that is the highest ranking uh, active duty military officer in the United States and the the most direct and, and then superior um, military advisor for any president. Um, and he says, and I, I, you have to agree with him. Said you know, you mentioned declaratory policy. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to what they say. Most of these autocratic, dangerous leaders, they're not bluffing most of the time. Um, and you note in the book. Putin, as early as 2007, even mm -hmm. before 2008, had publicly been making very critical statements yeah. of, of the West. Uh, for all you who might, might think of Jim as a great journalist, uh, he also, for, for two years, was the chief of staff uh, for Ambassador Gary Locke in, for our embassy in Beijing, so he was in the State Department uh, for a while with, with top secret clearance. Um, you were there around the time when President Xi came to power, and even shortly after that, he said similar type statements, yeah. and the quotes you have in here is, Blades in the back are what the United States is feeling in the West. Mm. 
And what is the idea that we should take from what they say publicly, and you can't just blow it off? The, um, the interesting thing about both, both Russia and China, Xi and Putin, these aren't secret plans like uh, hidden away on some server or in the last dusty drawer of something in the basement of the Kremlin or something. They're public. Mm -hmm. Xi, Putin, as you were saying, going back to 2007 uh, at Munich Security Conference, has announced to the world, you know, this, you, you know, I'm done with NATO and uh, I'm going to start clawing this back and so on. You know, he said it and he followed through a year later in Georgia and just kept going and going. Um, and for, for China, they, 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 have this, uh, they, they have this policy, they, they call it um, some under the banner of winning without fighting, you know, this idea of they, clawing back territory they believe they've lost, they hope, below the threshold of a hot war, and they've been pushing for it. And you see it, uh, for instance, in the South China Sea. I mean, China has done a massive land grab without firing a shot in the South China Sea by taking territory claimed by half a dozen nations, including some U.S. treaty allies, and just slowly but surely occupying it and then building it into massive military installations, um, unsinkable aircraft carriers, the U.S. military calls it. Now they own it. They own that space. Uh, they did it quietly, quietly. Taiwan would have to be more loud, right? They'd mm -hmm. have to do it. But, um, but they've been talking about this for some time. And it's kind of interesting. I talk about it in this book, and I talked about it in a book I wrote in 2019 called The Shadow War, which is a kind of similar thesis, but at the time that Russia and China were looking to claw this back below the threshold of, of a shooting war, is that successive U.S. administrations, both Democrat and Republican, just kind of missed this, right? They just, they, they imagined, um, they mirrored, basically. They looked at Russia and China and imagined that they want what we want, and that we could work with them they, they, they're, they're happy playing by our general rules. We can negotiate uh, all this kind of stuff, even when there was contradictory information in front of their eyes, like Georgia, like the South China Sea. And it's only in the last couple of years where it's become a kind of accepted view that these guys are in it to win it, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not going to play by the rules. They're not going to play by the rules. The new debate, actually, is not so much what in this country is not so much what they want, it's what the U.S. should do about it, because you, of course, have a America First camp here that is you know, willing to say, well, maybe those aren't really our fights. We can, we can uh, work with these guys in a different way. Um, and, and there's you know, corollary to, to President Xi and, and uh, Putin. Uh, for about 40 years, the U.S. has had a loose policy, strategic ambiguity, both mm. Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. The idea was, we will not definitively say if we will absolutely defend or not defend Taiwan if it comes to war with China, but we will leave enough uh, doubt that they hopefully are deterred. Um, following up on the declaratory policy and listening to what people say, uh, Biden, early in his presidency, said once we would defend Taiwan. Uh, Jake Sullivan, Blinken, others came out and kind of talked it back down. He said it again. People thought, okay, maybe he made a mistake twice, but he, you know in the book he said it four times. Mm. So what do you think that actually means? And, and Millie, Millie about yeah. Biden's comments said himself, he's like, I, you know, apply the declaratory policy to a U.S. Mm -hmm. president too. Generally when, when leaders make those statements, believe what they say. Biden has effectively uh, committed the U.S. to a military response to a, to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Not, not clear, does that mean, you know, two aircraft carriers between Taiwan and, and mainland China? Maybe not, but certainly a military response in a, in a public way that presidents have, neither Republican or Democratic presidents, even very tough China hawks have not done so in the past. And that is a, that's a change. It's, it's a big change um, and, and a deliberate one, a deliberate one by, by the president. Um, now, if, if Trump were to win in the fall, I, I have a whole chapter here about what what a, uh, a Trump foreign policy would look like in, in the context of this great power competition. And Trump's own former senior advisors, John Kelly, former chief of staff, Bolton, former national security advisor, and others um, say that he, he would have no interest in, in the U.S. defending Taiwan. In fact, Bolton tells a story I tell in the book where when he was president, Trump would sit at the desk in the Oval Office and hold up a Sharpie and point to the tip of the Sharpie and say, see that? That's Taiwan. And then he would point to the resolute desk and say, that's China. The point being, Taiwan has no chance against China, and therefore we have no business defending them. 
They also say, by the way, that if he were to be reelected, U.S. aid for Ukraine would end, and that Trump would likely, if not withdraw the U.S. from NATO, because that would require congressional action, uh, at, at a minimum, uh, basically neuter the mutual defense uh, Article 5 of that, because he calculates it's not in the U.S. interest to do it. So you have, again, that's, it's, a, it's, it's this kind of uh, fork in the road. Um, in November. Now, I talk a lot in the book about what the war games show about what a full-scale Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be, and it's ugly. It's ugly. But we're talking tens of thousands of dead service members on both sides in the first few days uh, of combat. We haven't seen anything like that since World War II. Um, CSIS did a war game of this, and you lose two aircraft carriers and dozens of ships uh, and aircraft at various installations in Asia, which is an ugly, ugly war. And China, by the way, loses a similar number, and Taiwan's forces are decimated. You sort of, you basically just burn it all down. And I, I, have, I have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old son. They're, they're not many years away from draft age. So personally, when I look at that, that's not a war I want. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a war any of us want. Um, then you have to look at the other side. What are the consequences? What would the consequences be of allowing China and Russia to absorb independent states uh, by force of arms? We, and we went through this, you know, 80 some odd years ago. Um, and I do believe this is a 1939 moment for the country um, and the world. And you have to decide um, one, really, how do you avert that? And, and by clear communications of limits and, and red lines, do you, can you make it clear that military action is not in your interest? I mean, this is, a, this is a tough calculation for leaders and for us. We have to decide what we're. John Kelly talks a lot in this book. Here's John Kelly, 40-year uh, general in the Marines, entered as an enlisted man in the Vietnam War, gold star father, right? He lost his son in Afghanistan. This man knows the cost of war. And he makes a point, he's like, have, have we had a conversation with the American public about what a war over Taiwan would look like. I don't think so. Have we talked in those terms about what the consequences might be, the cost? No, and you, you, would, you have to do that, right? Because this would be, the cost would be high. And, and maybe just for people to understand, um, getting into NATO is much clearer for a country to get in, you know, parliamentary or congressional approval. Um, getting out, um, even, if it might take congressional approval to do so, de facto a country can leave if their leader, in this case a U.S. president, refuses to, yeah. as commander in chief, commit the U.S. military right. to a country's defense. So yeah. even if we're still in NATO, it's basically ended NATO Absolutely. if we have a president that does not want mm -hmm. to defend an ally, correct? Yes, that's true. And okay. there was an attempt, I tell the story in the book in 2018 at the NATO summit where his own advisors say Trump nearly pulled the U.S. out of NATO at that time, and the thinking is that he would finish the deal in a, in a second term. But you're right. If you, as Commander in Chief, if you don't send troops to enforce the mutual defense clause, then then the the alliance doesn't exist. It doesn't. It's a it's a piece of paper. Um, and turning to Taiwan, it's it's great in the book. You interview everything from uh, colonels at, at various branches of of the Taiwanese military uh, to political leaders. Uh, to the highest level of people in, the, in their military. Um, how are they interpreting this? And I guess they know better than anybody, a new American president can change every four or yeah. eight years. Uh, we just have to be ready to defend ourselves. Yes. And I suppose, where, what, are they, what have they learned from the Ukraine war, and what are they doing to protect themselves moving forward? So um, they've learned, and, and the U.S. and its allies have learned that, that Smaller, more mobile is better, right? That you're not gonna, it, it's, it's a David versus Goliath kind of fight in Ukraine or in Taiwan. So you're not gonna beat China by building 351 Navy ships, right? It's just not possible. So you have to make, you have to raise the costs of a, an invasion of Taiwan. So that it's a lot of missile defense systems that can sink boats. It's, uh, it's uh, highly mobile units that if, if China were to do a D-Day style invasion that with weapons like the Javelin missile that was so successful, um, in Ukraine that you can just make it hard and costly and take time. Um, Millie talks about this, that the, the essential U.S. strategy is not today. Uh, for the, the, the Xi Jinping wakes up every morning and, and sort of looks at the 
pluses and minuses and is like, nah, I can't do it today. And then the next day, you hope that he makes that same calculation by adding inputs that, that would make it clear to him that it would be costly. When you talk to the Taiwanese, though, they take it very seriously. And I met, I went to the Penghu Islands, which is a little archipelago just to the um, west of Taiwan in the strait, which is where their frontline defenses are, their naval installations and air force bases and so on. They would be the first responders. And the folks there, they're training every day for the invasion. You know, I saw it happen. Now, on the flip side, kind of like I compared Taiwan to, to Beirut, where I spent a lot of time during the various, you know, wars, and, you know, there. Um, Beirut, here's Beirut, a place that's been surrounded by war for decades. And yet, somehow, people just kind of live, right? Because you have no choice but to live. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, war may be coming or may not be coming, but I got to, like, you know, I got to open my restaurant this morning, you know? And Taiwan has some of that too, you know, and the, the threat has been there. I mean, you go back, right? I mean, there's been a threat of a Chinese invasion since 1949. And it's certainly bigger now, but there's a, there's a little bit of a sense there that we, you know, when you talk to your taxi driver, they're like, ah, I don't know. I'm sick of hearing about that. Folks at the high level, they take it very seriously. Um, and just lastly, to compare it to Ukraine, um, US intelligence, did not have a, an accurate assessment of how incredibly well, incredibly bravely they would fight and innovative and yeah. um, just, you know, Russia came in and they punched them in the face and they punched them again yeah. and just kind of shocked the world. But a huge difference is that was 2022. They'd been fighting the Russians since 2014. They've had eight yes. years to fight the Russians, to learn how they fight, learn how they communicate, uh, learn their tactics. Some of the same, they share some of the same weapon systems. Yeah. Um, so kind of knew that they knew that they were willing to fight and going to fight. The Taiwanese do not have that combat experience. Mm. What do you think is the kind of political will and the public will in terms of actually fighting China? So uh, and it is true. So the, the reaction, just dialing back for a moment, the reaction to the 2014 invasion of Ukraine was largely muted. The, the, the one big positive change was that Ukraine basically transformed its military from nothing into a formidable, arguably Europe's most capable military mm. force. I mean, it makes like some of our NATO partners forces look kind of a little embarrassing, right? I mean, they got partly, which honed in combat, but they also trained up, and this was not by accident. You, you had a big investment from the US and NATO. They had forces there training, training them up on weapon systems to kind of you know, build a, a capable force, and they did, and that showed from 2022 onward. But um, with, uh, with Taiwan, um, they, uh, you know, they're learning from what's happening in Ukraine, and they have been in the midst of a shift for a number of years to this porcupine strategy of defense, which I talk about in the book, is the idea you know, to make Taiwan the porcupine, in that you know, they're not gonna beat the bear, right, in a, in a fist fight, but they're gonna make it hard to get swallowed. You know? mm -hmm. And so you gotta like sharpen the quills and add the quills to do that. And for years, Taiwan was more focused on like big legacy systems, like big ships and that kind of stuff. And, and they and the US and the Taiwanese have changed their strategy to be more like we're going to be mobile and nimble and you know, be able to fight them uh, David versus Goliath style and not so much head on. So they're learning. And then we're, you know, the weapon systems that we send to them fit that. You know, so fewer frigates and more javelins, you know, that kind of thing. And, and just in relation to that, uh, you mentioned earlier it might not be a totally kinetic, full-scale amphibious assault, uh, massive airstrikes, missile strikes, uh, Chinese Marines landing on the beach. It might be you mentioned the, the boa constrictor, a naval blockade, choking China off. You know, gradually. I think uh, one of the Taiwanese mentioned this to you. You know, maybe you can't eat a porcupine, but you can <laughs> suffocate a porcupine. Yes. Yeah. Um, if if that was to happen, that's not an absolute attack. But for many countries that we consider an act of war, what do you think the United States would do? Well, uh, under this president, they're, I mean, he's committed to a military response. Under, if, if Trump wins, it doesn't, I mean, it seems like he, he would say, okay, I can make a deal and survive without Taiwan. Here, here's one reason why we would all notice a Taiwanese invasion, whether we're involved or not. 85% of uh, semiconductors are made there. So it would, uh, if that stops, you know, the, the world economy comes to a halt on, you know, your, in your phones, your cars, you know, you name it. It's the reason you pass the CHIPS Act, because they're trying to, to, the U.S. is, the world is trying to become 
less reliant on one place who does it really darn well. That's why, that's why it's happened that way. But they're trying to build up capacity here. Even Taiwan is trying to do that. They're, they're a partner in some of these, you know, where you have these facilities coming up in, in like Columbus and uh, where was, you know, in Arizona, that's what the president was visiting the mm -hmm. other day, is to spread that capacity around. The trouble is it takes a long time. It takes years to build up those facilities credibly. You can't just like do it tomorrow. So anytime in the next five years that there is, whether, it, whether it's a punch through the front door invasion or a blockade invasion, we're all gonna feel it. And that's just one of those examples that this stuff, like it's not, we can't retreat behind the ramparts and, and feel like everything will be fine. The other point I make about this is that even on, beyond the economic costs, the essential theory of the book is that the 30 years or so that we've enjoyed post-1989, fall of the Berlin Wall, post-1991, when we all thought, I thought, you know, you know when, when R Russians stopped being the bad guys in the movies, right, you know, we thought we were in this, this, you know, the Cold War was over, right? We'd moved beyond that, end of history, you know, didn't work out that way. But the things that, that have built, been built up that we enjoy impact our lives whether we're there or not. I mean, the, the, Europe's economic growth that makes them a big trading partner for us is in part because Europe has doubled in size since the fall of the Warsaw Pact. And these countries have, have, have vibrant, Poland has a vibrant economy now, that kind of stuff, that helps us. Uh, Asian shipping lanes are open, we get 90% of the stuff in your house probably you know, through those shipping lanes. Um, China benefits from that, but so, but so do we. And it, it makes stuff cheaper. And, it, and it, it, it means that your company or mine you know, has offices open there and is doing trade. And I don't know what portion of your, you know, your, your annual report has income from those economies, but it's probably a pretty decent portion, right? It, whether you, you know, in your 401k as well, like we have those benefits. I was thinking about this the other day, you know, our kids can go to semesters abroad in Prague. You know, I couldn't do that because Prague was part of the Warsaw Pact. I mean, these things all have impacts. And if, if you let those kind of, if you just let that system fall apart, there are costs to it um, beyond, uh, beyond the suffering, you know, the very real suffering of the Ukrainian people or the Taiwanese people. It's, it's real. Um, and then I'm gonna turn the, the uh, audience questions. I always like to include something optimistic, even though a lot of what we cover, it's, it's not always the, uh, the yeah. brightest subjects and topics, um, but it's important to be realistic and, and know yeah. what we face. Um, you mentioned towards the end of the book ways we can yeah. slow this down. We can not just add deterrence, but add communication. Mm. Can you, you, did, you talk about the great concern that there is not no longer good military to military yeah. communication, say with the Russians, uh, uh, you know, with Europe or the United States. Uh, even with China, the communications that used to be there between Chinese and Taiwanese military is yeah. not there. With the U.S., it's less as well. Um, but maybe an odd, hopeful note, I mean, I'm just thinking of is uh, the end of, of uh, President Trump's presidency, the, the Chinese were legitimately concerned that something could happen and uh, Trump might actually do something militarily. Mm -hmm. They were legitimately concerned that could happen and, and didn't know if they should be preparing for a military action. But General Milley, uh, Trump's uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, phoned his counterpart directly and, and kind of said, no, yeah. this is not gonna happen. You do not have to worry about it. That's a positive example, yeah. but it was an extremely high level example and maybe you need, what do we really need beyond just so, you know, a dire situation in the very top, I hopefully talking? So start with some hope, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm a generally hopeful person. I think there is reason for hope. Let's look at some po positives here. Like if we, if we were talking two years ago, about how NATO would respond to this. There was genuine, I mean, it was certainly Putin's calculation that NATO would split um, and that the US would get bored and so on. I mean, th the initial response has been remarkable, right? I mean, NATO came together. It's arguably stronger than it's been in, in many years. Um, you, NATO's expanded. It's added two members, Sweden and Finland, which is enormous. I mean, just adding Finland extends the, extends the frontier between NATO and Russia by 800 miles. I mean, these are formidable countries with formidable militaries who, it shows the, the, the folly of Putin's decision to invade Ukraine because Finland was, a, was always kind of a, it, it was a European country, but that it calculated it had to be an intermediary, right? No longer, they're, they're a treaty ally of the US. So the, and beyond that, 
we never want to think of Russia and China as 10 feet tall. They've got major issues. You know, Russia, to, to quote John McCain, he's right. You know, it's a gas station parading as a, as a country. It has one export. That's all it does. No one buys Russian anything, right? It's a, and it's a shrinking country. It's an old country. And outside of Moscow, I've traveled through Russia. It is a medieval country, right? I mean, it's, so it's weak. It's got more nukes than anybody in the world, but it's weak, you know. China, you know, the, the, the sort of interminable rise is over. Its economy has, has flattened and it's hit the demographic wall way earlier than certainly we did or Japan, you know, in that it's, it, it's getting older and the, pop, the, the population is shrinking, which has, and it's got a massive debt problem, um, which is ironically the reason, one of the reasons that the US and China have had this kind of mini detente in recent months is that the calculation is she is like, I gotta sort out my economy. I can't be like punching the US in the face right now. So you, you have, we have strengths and we have advantages. And by the way, our economy is growing faster than any other economy in the world, right? These, these are things you have to remember. On the bad side, to your point, the, the relations between the countries are not just more hostile, but a lot of the, the safety net that we had before doesn't exist anymore. Bill Burns talks about this very early in the book. We have no nuclear treaties with China, and China is growing its nuclear forces exponentially. Uh, the nuclear treaties we had with Russia, two of them are gone, uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, ABM Treaty, and uh, it's not clear that Russia's abiding by them. We have no treaties for cyber weapons and enormous capabilities, and by the way, we've all planted offensive cyber weapons in each person's, each country's system. You know, we could turn the lights off in Moscow, they could turn the lights off in Houston at the, in the first stages of a war. No treaties there. No treaties covering the weaponization of space. And that's problematic. And the way we talk to each other, which was developed during the Cold War precisely to avoid World War III, those have dissipated. They're not gone totally, but they've dissipated. And that's, uh, that's problematic because picking up the phone makes a difference. I mean, th these things were developed with Russia post-1962 because we got really damn close to nuclear war over Cuba and they didn't want it to happen again. But those things have kind of fallen by the wayside. And we want to be, um, so we've got to find ways to, to increase that communication, but also clearly communicate what US and its allies' limits are. So there's no misunderstanding, you know, and that, those are some of the elements that I talk about in the final chapter about how to avoid this getting hot. Um, two questions about obviously a, a major you know, development in the last six months or so that is, has greatly impacted um, the amount of attention given to Ukraine and obviously the focus of, in Congress uh, for the US and others uh, around the world. Um, there's a name on uh, this one, but it just says, uh, would you talk about uh, your take on Gaza? And I suppose, you know, how, it, how it's impacted uh, this entire picture, maybe in particular Ukraine. And then David asks, uh, the war in Israel, uh, uh, Israel and Gaza has an impact on global affairs that causes, um, has, you know, will it cause other conflicts to escalate? Can you, I suppose, kind of give your, you know, very easy, sure. short answer of how Gaza is shaping these, the, uh, the, kind of global picture as well. Well, it's, 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 well, it's not funny, but it's here. I, I was in Israel uh, after October 7th, late October, early November, as, well, just as the war is just exploding there. And, and I'd given my manuscript in, because uh, you know, typically a book's coming out in March, you gotta hand the thing about six months before. And I called my editor from, from northern Israel, and I was like, you know, I think I should probably add some pages on this war. Because, and, and the, the angle, which I, which I have in there, and it's true, is that, Russia got involved early on in the way that it gets involved in this kind of stuff, which is to stir the pot. They love, they thrive on chaos. So here you have a war between America's ally Gaza, America's ally Israel, and Russia, which by the way, is cozy with Hamas. I mean, Hamas leaders visit the Kremlin, and they did before October 7th, and they did afterwards. And Russia calculates that it's just a good way to occupy the US there mess with its ally, um, and so in the midst of this, Russia sends a missile defense system to Hezbollah in the north, because at the time, of course, there was concern, and I was on the northern border, about expansion to another front there, and what better way to lengthen that war if it were to happen than to give Hezbollah the ability to shoot down 
uh, Israeli warplanes. It's just like a classic Russian move. It's like, how can I mess with this? I'm going to send a big gun to these guys here. Um, and so that's, you know, that's how they operate. And they're very much involved. And they love to see this drag out. And they love to see the US isolated on this issue uh, in the region. It just serves their interests. Just you know, again, like kind of stirring the pot and, and messing with us. And by the way, it like, defies like, Russian history, because as you know, Russian Jews, it's just a long history there, and you have this history of many who, who left Russia to go to Israel, many of them in senior levels of the, you know, the enormous ties there, but they don't care, right? The, you know, Putin doesn't care. He just wants to mess with the place. Um, you touched upon it, you know, somewhat, and you discuss it more in the book. Um, but David asks, can you discuss what will be the outcome of the technological war with China? Chips, AI, uh, the results? In the book, you also talk about cyber space, even near space. Um, can you talk about those huge technological developments that are even beyond uh, the typical battlefield yeah. or, or the politics? Any, any war that we would have with Russia or China would be multi-front technologically, and cyber would be an enormous aspect to it, as would space. Um, there are already weapons. China and Russia have both tested weapons in space. Directed energy weapons, yes, lasers in space. They could like zap satellites. There, there are kill vehicles there. You may remember the story about a month ago of, of uh, US concern about Russia putting a nuke in space. We had some reporting on that. The idea being light off a nuke and you zap satellites. Uh, you fry them with an EMP, basically. Um, not a good thing. Uh, and the reason that's a priority for Russia and China is that we're highly dependent on satellite communications and technology. The, bo both our military is, you know, smart bombs are not smart without GPS. It's how we do surveillance. It's how we watch what they're doing, moving their pieces around. It's how we do secure communications. But it's also our economy is enormous, or enormously dependent on it. Um, GPS provides time stamps for financial transactions. You take those out, it's a good way to, to throttle financial markets. In addition to cyber attacks, uh, train signals, you know, they have a GPS component in it. So any war that we have, highly capable systems that would, again, you talk about, can we hold this at arm's length? No, like, we'd be in the dark. We'd be in the dark. It'd be, you'd be like living in your basement. It would be no fun. Uh, and that's deliberate, right? Because both Russia and China would want to exact pain on the civilian population in the event of a war. Um, so, you know, that's why not having treaties and kind of rules of the road for the use of those weapons is concerning, because we don't, you know? And uh, like I said, they have penetrated key civilian infrastructure here with cyber weapons. We've done the same to them. Um, and. Uh, you know, all you got to do is turn those things on in the event of war. Now, we have defenses against that, but they're imperfect. I mean, we've all, I mean, you've seen. How many, raise your hand if you've been hacked. I mean, if you don't know you've been hacked, you've been hacked, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know, I would say, like, I've been hacked four times because, and probably more, just because Anthem Health Insurance was hacked. That was a Chinese operation. So China has all of me and my family's health information. Equifax was hacked, Chinese operation, so they have all my financial information. Marriott Hotels was hacked, which you think, oh, who cares about that? China does that because they want to establish travel patterns of people so they could pick out who the spies are, you know, one thing. And then the other one is, because I, I work for government, and I'm sure some other folks worked in the government here, there was the OPM hack a few years ago, Office of Personnel Management, which has, again, all like my private information. So somewhere on a server is a very detailed file about me and my family and who I owe money to and, you know, you name it, where we go on vacation. So that, that kind of stuff is all part of the picture. Um, we have a lot of uh, great questions, uh, probably about 20 or so. Mm -hmm. On time to get to all of them, I'll give them all to Jim uh, to look at afterwards. And, and again, he, he is going to sign books. You're, you've been volunteered. Uh, no, uh, so too. we'll be doing that outside. But just a quick few to, to finish with. Um, uh, a good question for the audience to follow up with what you're discussing. Um, uh, there's an nameless one, but someone asks, is there any formal national preparation for nuclear war? Mm -hmm. And if not, why? National preparation is in for the population. I, I suppose, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, when's the last yeah. time you did a you know fallout drill in your mm -hmm. classroom, right? It does, yeah. We don't. You know, that's one of the things we don't talk about it, right? We don't. I don't think the population is aware of the threat, and I don't. I don't know. What would that add? I mean, it's like. Uh, I mean, we certainly talk like the, the, we're developing or trying to develop. Uh, you know, anti-ballistic missile weapons, and those tests sometimes work, sometimes they don't. The trouble is. 
The missiles get faster, so they're harder to take out. You know, the, the hypersonic missiles, you know, might render those systems kind of useless at the end of the day. And then you have, I mean, I didn't talk about this. Ukraine is like a laboratory of war. And we've seen the dawn of the drone age in, uh, in Ukraine. Both Russia and Ukraine using drones very effectively for surveillance, for, I mean, you've seen these like little quadcopters that they've fitted with grenades to like, you know, target individual soldiers, they do. Uh, Russia is using drones to just devastate uh, um, Ukrainian cities in just horrible ways, these Shahad drones from Iran. Um, we've seen sea drones used to enormous effect by Ukraine. Ukraine does not have a navy, and yet they've totally neutered the, the Black Sea Fleet, this, you know, the, the vaunted Black Sea Fleet. They've sunk a bunch of them and chased them 200 miles uh, east out. They, basically, the Black Sea is not safe for the Black Sea Fleet. It's pretty remarkable because those like little boats, it looks like someone's there with like a little joystick, and bang, the ship's done. Done. Also, ground drones, you're seeing those as well for the first time. So we, we have um, super advanced warfare playing out before our eyes. And the reason I mention that is that um, there, you know, what was the movie? Uh, it was a couple years ago about like a drone swarm that like tried to t took out the U.S. president. It was a Gerard Butler film. Mm -hmm. It was like five years ago. Drone swarms are if they're not here today, they're here tomorrow. And swarms with, with some AI direction can overwhelm is the concern both ship defense systems, but also potentially our nuclear defense systems, which weren't that great anyway. So it's you know it's like. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> fact. <laughs> and, and before I just get to these two two ones, there I think good way to, to wrap up. Uh, just on this subject matter, uh, I know some of you were signed up. We were to host uh, Sweden's foreign uh, minister Tobias uh, Billström last week. Uh, the embassy had to reschedule that, so we hope to do that later in the year. Obviously, they just joined NATO, so it should be an interesting discussion. Um, and in terms of the U.S. military, probably one of the, the most prominent stars in a long time, and he's got four stars of his own, we we're, we're have General Petraeus on Tuesday, uh, so this coming Tuesday. And related to Taiwan, one of the people who probably knows the American military perspective better than anybody, um, uh, recently retired Admiral uh, 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 Davidson. He was the 25th yeah. U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific commander. So that meant that he was, if a war had started with China uh, over Taiwan, this is the commander who would have been leading the U.S. response, uh, basically in all of the, the Western Pacific and, and also in the mo most of the Indian Ocean. So yeah. you want to know if you want to talk to people who really know the inside uh, baseball, he'll be that. And by the way, he, he's he's someone who, when he was commander at PACOM, said it's just a matter of when, not if, China invades Taiwan. That's his view. Yeah. So not again, not terribly optimistic, but we try. Um, but two ways maybe to bring a little bit of a, a brighter end to this. Uh, Dennis uh, says. You know, what were the arguments, in your opinion, that were used to persuade Putin that using nuclear weapons were off the table? In particular, you mentioned uh, probably it was really more what India and China would have said than Europeans or the U.S. So, and, and maybe similarly, is there any way to, to those similar outside uh, third parties to kind of well, get, get President Xi to take down his, his uh, perspective as well? Well, that, that, I think we should look at that as a sign of hope, because here you had not quite, well, certainly adversaries with China, India, some, somewhere in between, but you had um, unexpected partners working together to avert an escalation in Ukraine, and it worked. You know, the, the U.S. called up India and, and China, and they were very public about it. If you look at the public statements at the time, they were like, no, nuclear war is a bad idea, and that worked, and that's a good sign. There, there are times that even with your adversary or competitor or not quite ally, you can work together to avert the worst outcomes. And that, that's a model, and Blinken talks in the book about how you know, that can be a model uh, for things going forward. Uh, that's the hopeful side. What else did you ask? Oh, and, and then just related to that, um, you had top secret clearance for two years in the U.S. Embassy uh, right around the time that, that she came to power. Yeah. I know you can't talk about everything, but um, with Russia, obviously, you know China is going to be a big influence. India is a potential influence. With China, they're the, the first or the second biggest dog in the world with us. Yeah, yeah. Who could actually give any influence on them? Yeah. And you, you also asked, what, sorry, one of the questioners asked what the arguments were. Basically, the arguments were um, the world will be against you, Russia. Uh, and even your supposed best friend, China, will be against you if you do this. But also, I was told, and I talk about this in the book, that the US communicated, if you do this, we will strike Russian targets directly. Not Russian targets in Russia, but Russian pieces in Ukraine was the idea that that, that would be the 
the breaker that would take, you know, what has been the limit, no U.S. direct involvement in the war, but that we will take out your, your systems that might launch this kind of stuff. So that, you know, some combination of that for the, for the time uh, averted that threat. And, and lastly, do you think there's any comparable uh, voice in another country that could, could uh, kind of bring Xi back? From, from a, you know. I don't think so because it's, it's a strategic decision. She, not only from a historical perspective does he see himself as the one who's going to get Taiwan back, but bigger picture, both Putin and Xi see the US-led rules-based international order um, as fundamentally in our interests and not theirs. That it's a skewed system, serves you guys, but not us. And, and the general view is that Russia just wants to bring it down. They, they thrive in chaos. Uh, Bill Burns says that, that they're the guy, in effect, that wants to bring the temple down. China wants to replace it. Uh, they like having a system that kind of works, but they want to be, if not at the top, equal with us at the top. They don't want to be a subordinate player, and they want to play by their rules. And that's, um, you know, so those are, those are strategic decisions. They're not going to change because someone's a good negotiator or has a good relationship with them. Okay, a great uh, way to end it and bring it back to a, a personal level, uh, a domestic level, and a level just right here in the audience or just Americans in general. Uh, Linda, one of our longtime great members, asks, uh, how do we, whose only power is our vote, support Taiwan uh, and Ukraine? Well, listen, whatever your politics, there's a clear choice in the fall as to, as to the approach to the world. And I'm not making this up. I mean, I talk in the book, this is based on his own senior advisors serving him, and public statements, frankly. Trump's view is, is, a, is a, that's not our fight kind of view. Uh, Ukraine, even Eastern Europe, arguably, Taiwan, and he, and he seems to have this view that through force of personality and negotiation skills, that he can work out a deal with Putin and Xi on things that, if you look at the track record and what they want, it, it's hard to see how that's possible, given they have long-term interests that have nothing to do with what the occupant of the White House is, right? You know, Russia wants to recreate. It's near abroad, uh, something resembling the USSR. China wants to own Asia, right? And they want to kind of push us back. Those things are not going to change, you know, because you sell more soybeans. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's hard to see how that works. So the, the you know, it depends on what kind of role you see for the US and the world. And by the way, the, the, the Trump view is one that is, it's not so much a Republican view, right? It's an America first view that would change what has been a largely bipartisan approach to the world for 80 some odd years, right? In terms of alliances. So that's a, it's a clear choice. I mean, there, there are some checks to that. Um, I mean, NATO wouldn't disappear. It, it would just be without the US, the largest military in the world. And Europe has its own uh, priorities and so on. but. Um, but in terms of America's role, that's a, that's a clear choice. Now, you can make a very reasonable decision that that um, that you don't want any of those war. Well, no one wants war. I mean, that, that's another good good news piece from the book is that the U.S. assessment is that, and and our allies' assessment is that Russia and China don't want a great power war either because they know that that wouldn't be good for them either. It would be messy and bloody and damaging and costly. Um, the thing is, what what balance can each side live with, and, and Russia and China have a very forward-leaning balance in terms of to what they want to accomplish, is that important to you, right? Um, is, you know, do, who do you calculate? Do, do you calculate that um, ceding that ground makes war more or less likely? I would argue that, that based on the lessons of 1939, that ceding the ground arguably makes war more likely. I don't know that. I can't see the future. There's certainly escalation risks, right? Um, and those are real. And we saw that in late 2022. Uh, but a lot of it comes down to what your vision is of the US and what, you're what cost you're willing to pay, what you're willing to give up, right? Yeah. And uh, if, like I said, we're going to, Jim will be signing books uh, over there. So if you'll bear with me, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but I will just, we'll walk them out so you can get to the table there and sign quickly. I, and and y'all can maybe chat a little bit at the table. Um, but will you all join me in please thanking thank you. Uh, Jim Scudo for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.